Section 9 of My First Summer in the Sierra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My First Summer in the Sierra by John Muir. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. July 24. Clouds at noon, occupying half the sky gave half an hour of heavy rain to wash one of the cleanest landscapes in the world. How well it is washed! The sea is hardly less dusty than the ice-burnished pavements and ridges, domes and canyons and summit peaks, plashed with snow like waves with foam. How fresh the woods are, and calm, after the last films of clouds have been wiped from the sky! A few minutes ago every tree was excited, bowing to the roaring storm, waving, swirling, tossing their branches in glorious enthusiasm like worship. But though to the outer ear these trees are now silent, their songs never cease. Every hidden cell is throbbing with music and life, every fibre thrilling like harp-strings while incense is ever flowing from the balsam bells and leaves. No wonder the hills and groves were God's first temples, and the more they are cut down and hewn into cathedrals and churches, the farther off and dimmer seems the Lord himself. The same may be said of stone temples. Yonder, to the eastward of our camp grove, stands one of nature's cathedrals, hewn from the living rock, almost conventional in form, about two thousand feet high, nobly adorned with spires and pinnacles, thrilling under floods of sunshine, as if alive like a grove temple, and well-named Cathedral Peak. Even Shepherd Billy turns at times to this wonderful mountain building, though apparently deaf to all stone sermons. Snow that refused to melt in fire would hardly be more wonderful than unchanging dullness in the rays of God's beauty. I have been trying to get him to walk to the brink of Yosemite for a view, offering to watch the sheep for a day, while he should enjoy what tourists come from all over the world to see. But though within a mile of the famous valley, he will not go to it, even out of mere curiosity. What, said he, is Yosemite but a canyon, a lot of rocks, a hole in the ground, a place dangerous about falling into, a damn good place to keep away from? But think of the waterfalls, Billy. Just think of that big stream we crossed the other day, falling half a mile through the air. Think of that, and the sound it makes. You can hear it now like the roar of the sea. Thus I pressed Yosemite upon him like a missionary offering the gospel, but he would have none of it. "'I should be afraid to look over so high a wall,' he said. "'It would make my head swim. There is nothing worth seeing anyhow, only rocks, and I see plenty of them here. Tourists that spend their money to see rocks and falls are fools, that's all. You can't humbug me.' I've been in this country too long for that. Such souls, I suppose, are asleep, or smothered, and befogged beneath mean pleasures and cares. July 25 Another cloudland. Some clouds have an overripe, decaying look, watery and bedraggled, and drawn out into wind-torn shreds and patches giving the sky a littered appearance. Not so, these Sierra summer midday clouds. All are beautiful, with smooth, definite outlines and curves like those of glacier-polished domes. They begin to grow about eleven o'clock, and seem so wonderfully near and clear from this high camp, one is tempted to try to climb them and trace the streams that pour like cataracts from their shadowy fountains. The rain to which they give birth is often very heavy, a sort of 
waterfall as imposing as if pouring from rock mountains. Never in all my travels have I found anything more truly novel and interesting than these midday mountains of the sky, their fine tones of colour, majestic visible growth, and ever-changing scenery in general effects, though mostly as well let alone, as far as description goes. I oftentimes think of Shelley's cloud poem, I sift the snow on the mountains below. July 26 Ramble to the summit of Mount Hoffman, eleven thousand feet high, the highest point in life's journey my feet have yet touched. And what glorious landscapes are about me! New plants, new animals, new crystals, and multitudes of new mountains far higher than Hoffman, towering in glorious array along the axis of the range, serene, majestic, snow-laden, sun-drenched, vast domes and ridges shining below them, forests, lakes and meadows in the hollows, the pure, blue, bell-flower sky brooding them all, a glory day of admission into a new realm of wonders, as if nature had wooingly whispered, Come higher! What questions I asked, and how little I know of all the vast show, and how eagerly, tremulously hopeful of some day knowing more, learning the meaning of these divine symbols crowded together on this wondrous page. Mount Hoffman is the highest part of a ridge or spur about fourteen miles from the axis of the main range, perhaps a remnant brought into relief and isolated by unequal denudation. The southern slopes shed their waters into Yosemite Valley by Tenaya and Dome Creeks, the northern in part into the Tuolumne River, but mostly into the Merced by Yosemite Creek. The rock is mostly granite, with some small piles and crests rising here and there in picturesque, pillared, and castellated remnants of red metamorphic slates. Both the granite and slates are divided by joints, making them separable into blocks like the stones of artificial masonry, suggesting the scripture, He hath builded the mountains. Great banks of snow and ice are piled into hollows on the cool, precipitous north side, forming the highest perennial sources of Yosemite Creek. The southern slopes are much more gradual and accessible. Narrow, slot-like gorges extend across the summit at right angles, which look like lanes, formed evidently by the erosion of less resisting beds. They are usually called Devil's Slides, though they lie farther above the region usually haunted by the devil, for though we read that he once climbed an exceeding high mountain, he cannot be much of a mountaineer, for his tracks are seldom seen above the timber line. The broad grey summit is barren and desolate-looking in general views, wasted by ages of gnawing storms, but looking at the surface in detail, one finds it covered by thousands and millions of charming plants, with leaves and flowers so small they form no mass of colour visible at a distance of a few hundred yards. Beds of azure daisies smile confidingly in moist hollows, and along the banks of small rills, with several species of eregonum, silky-leaved ivesia, penstemon, orthocarpus, and patches of primula sofruticosa, a beautiful shrubby species. Here also I find bryanthus, a charming heathwort, covered with purple flowers and dark green foliage like heather, and three trees new to me, a hemlock and two pines. The hemlock, Tsuga martensiana, is the most beautiful conifer I have ever seen. The branches, and also the main axis, droop in a singularly graceful way, and the dense foliage covers the delicate, sensitive, swaying branchlets all around. 
It is now in full bloom, and the flowers, together with thousands of last season's cones still clinging to the drooping sprays, display wonderful wealth of colour, brown and purple and blue. Gladly I climbed the first tree I found to revel in the midst of it. How the touch of the flowers makes one's flesh tingle! The pistillate are dark, rich purple, and almost translucent. The staminate blue, a vivid, pure tone of blue like the mountain sky. The most uncommonly beautiful of all the Sierra tree flowers I have seen. How wonderful that, with all its delicate feminine grace and beauty of form and dress and behaviour, this lovely tree up here, exposed to the wildest blasts, has already endured the storms of centuries of winters. The two pines are also brave storm-enduring trees, the mountain pine, Pinus monticola, and the dwarf pine, Pinus albicaulis. The mountain pine is closely related to the sugar pine, though the cones are only about four to six inches long. The largest trees are from five to six feet in diameter, at four feet above the ground, the bark rich brown. Only a few storm-beaten adventurers approach the summit of the mountain. The dwarf, or white-bark pine, is the species that forms the timber line, where it is so completely dwarfed that one may walk over the top of a bed of it as over snow-pressed chaparral. How boundless the day seems as we revel in these storm-beaten sky-gardens amid so vast a congregation of onlooking mountains. Strange and admirable it is that the more savage and chilly and storm-chafed the mountains, the finer the glow on their faces, and the finer the plants they bear. The myriads of flowers tinging the mountain top do not seem to have grown out of the dry, rough gravel of disintegration, but rather they appear as visitors a cloud of witnesses to nature's love in what we in our timid ignorance and unbelief call howling desert. The surface of the ground, so dull and forbidding at first sight, besides being rich in plants, shines and sparkles with crystals. Mica, hornblende, feldspar, quartz, tourmaline, the radiance in some places is so great as to be fairly dazzling. Keen lance rays of every colour, flashing, sparkling in glorious abundance, joining the plants in their fine, brave beauty work. Every crystal, every flower, a window opening into heaven, a mirror reflecting the Creator. From garden to garden, ridge to ridge, I drifted, enchanting, now on my knees gazing into the face of a daisy, now climbing again and again among the purple and azure flowers of the hemlocks, now down into the treasuries of the snow, or gazing afar over domes and peaks, lakes and woods, and the billowy glaciated fields of the upper Tuolumne, and trying to sketch them. In the midst of such beauty, pierced with its rays, one's body is all one tingling palate. Who wouldn't be a mountaineer? Up here all the world's prizes seem nothing. The largest of the many glacier lakes in sight, and the one with the finest shore scenery, is Tanaya, about a mile long, with an imposing mountain dipping its feet into it on the south side. Cathedral Peak, a few miles above its head, many smooth, swelling rock waves and domes on the north, and in the distance, southward, a multitude of snowy peaks, the fountain heads of rivers. Lake Hoffman lies shimmering beneath my feet, mountain pines around its shining rim. To the northward, the picturesque basin of Yosemite Creek glitters with lakelets and pools but the eye is soon drawn away from these bright mirror wells, however attractive, to revel in the glorious congregation of peaks on the axis of the range, in their robes of snow 
and light. Carlo caught an unfortunate woodchuck when it was running from a grassy spot to its boulder pile home, one of the hardiest of the mountain animals. I tried hard to save him, but in vain. After telling Carlo that he must be careful not to kill anything, I caught sight for the first time of the curious pica, or little chief hare, that cuts large quantities of lupins and other plants, and lays them out to dry in the sun for hay, which it stores in underground barns to last through the long snowy winter. Coming upon these plants, freshly cut and lying in handfuls here and there on the rocks, has a startling effect of busy life on the lonely mountain top. These little haymakers, endowed with brain stuff something like our own, God up here looking after them, what lessons they teach, how they widen our sympathy. An eagle, soaring above a sheer cliff, or I suppose its nest is, makes another striking show of life, and helps to bring to mind the other people of the so-called solitude, deer in the forest, caring for their young, the strong, well-clad, well-fed bears, the lively throng of squirrels, the blessed birds, great and small, stirring and sweetening the groves, and the clouds of happy insects filling the sky with joyous hum as part and parcel of the downpouring sunshine. All these come to mind, as well as the plant people, and the glad streams singing their way to the sea. But most impressive of all is the vast, glowing countenance of the wilderness in awful, infinite repose. Toward sunset enjoyed a fine run to camp down the long south slopes, across ridges and ravines, gardens and avalanche gaps, through the firs and chaparral, enjoying wild excitement an excess of strength. And so ends a day that will never end. July 27. Up and away to Lake Tanaya. Another big day, enough for a lifetime. The rocks, the air, everything speaking with audible voice or silent. Joyful, wonderful, enchanting, banishing weariness and sense of time. No longing for anything now or hereafter as we go home into the mountain's heart. The level sunbeams are touching the fir tops, every leaf shining with dew. I'm holding an easterly course, the deep canyons of Tanaya Creek on the right hand, Mount Hoffman on the left, and the lake straight ahead about ten miles distant the summit of Mount Hoffman about three thousand feet above me, Tanaya Creek four thousand feet below, and separated from the shallow irregular valley along which most of the way lies by smooth domes and wave ridges. Many mossy emerald bogs, meadows and gardens in rocky hollows to wade and saunter through, and what fine plants they give me, what joyful streams I have to cross, and how many views are displayed of the Hoffman and Cathedral Peak masonry, and what a wondrous breath of shining granite pavement to walk over for the first time about the shores of the lake. On I sauntered in freedom complete, body without weight as far as I was aware, now wading through starry Parnassia bogs, now through gardens, shoulder-deep in larkspur and lilies, grasses and rushes, shaking off showers of dew, crossing piles of crystalline moraine boulders, bright mirror pavements, and cool, cheery streams going to Yosemite, crossing bryanthus carpets and the scoured pathways of avalanches, and thickets of snow-pressed ceanothus, then down, a broad majestic stairway into the ice-sculptured lake basin. The snow on the high mountains is melting fast, and the streams are singing bankful, swaying softly through the level meadows and bogs, quivering with sun-spangles, swirling in potholes, resting in deep pools, leaping, 
shouting in wild, exulting energy over rough, bolder dams, joyful, beautiful in all their forms. No Sierra landscape that I have seen holds anything truly dead or dull, or any trace of what in manufactories is called rubbish or waste. Everything is perfectly clean and pure, and full of divine lessons. This quick, inevitable interest attaching to everything seems marvellous until the hand of God becomes visible. Then it seems reasonable that what interests Him may well interest us. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. One fancies a heart like our own must be beating in every crystal and cell, and we feel like stopping to speak to the plants and animals as friendly fellow mountaineers. Nature, as a poet, an enthusiastic working man, becomes more and more visible the farther and higher we go, for the mountains are fountains, beginning places, however related to sources beyond mortal ken. I found three kinds of meadows. 1. Those contained in basins not yet filled with earth enough to make a dry surface. They are planted with several species of carax, and have their margins diversified with robust flowering plants, such as veratrum, larkspur, lupin, etc. 2. Those contained in the same sort of basins, once lakes like the first, but so situated in relation to the streams that flow through them, and beds of transportable sand, gravel, etc., that they are now high and dry, and well drained. This dry condition and corresponding difference in their vegetation may be caused by no superiority of position, or power of transporting filling material in the streams that belong to them, but simply by the basin being shallower, and therefore sooner filled. They are planted with grasses, mostly fine, silky, and rather short-leaved calamagrosis and agrostis, being the principal genera. They form delightfully smooth level sods, in which one finds two or three species of gentian, and as many of purple and yellow orthocarpus, violet, vicinium, calmia, bryanthus, and lonicera. 3. Meadows hanging on ridge and mountain slopes, not in basins at all, but made and held in place by masses of boulders and fallen trees, which, forming dams one above another in close succession on small, outspread, channelless streams, have collected soil enough for the growth of grasses, carices, and many flowering plants, and being kept well watered without being subject to currents sufficiently strong to carry them away, a hanging or sloping meadow is the result. Their surfaces are seldom so smooth as the others, being roughened more or less by the projecting tops of the dam rocks or logs. But at a little distance this roughness is not noticed, and the effect is very striking. Bright green, fluent, down-sweeping flowery ribbons on grey slopes. The broad shallow streams these meadows belong to are mostly derived from the banks of snow, and because the soil is well drained in some places, while in others the dam rocks are packed close and corked with bits of wood and leaves, making boggy patches, the vegetation of course is correspondingly varied. I saw patches of willow, bryanthus, and a fine show of lilies on some of them not forming a margin, but scattered about among the carax and grass. Most of these meadows are now in their prime. How wonderful must be the temper of the elastic leaves of grasses and sedges, to make curves so perfect and fine! Tempered a little harder, they would stand erect, stiff and bristly, like strips of metal. A little softer, and every leaf would lie flat and what fine painting and tinting there is on the glooms and pales, stamens and feathery pistols! 
butterflies, coloured like the flowers, waver above them in wonderful profusion, and many other beautiful winged people, numbered and known and loved only by the Lord, are waltzing together high overhead, seemingly in pure play and hilarious enjoyment of their little sparks of life. How wonderful they are! How do they get a living and endure the weather? How are their little bodies, with muscles, nerves, organs, kept warm and jolly in such admirable exuberant health? Regarded only as mechanical inventions, how wonderful they are! Compared with these, Godlike man's greatest machines are as nothing. Most of the sandy gardens on moraines are in prime beauty like the meadows, though some on the north sides of rocks and behind groves of sapling pines have not yet bloomed. On sunny sheets of crystal soil, along the slopes of the Hoffman Mountains, I saw extensive patches of Ivesia and purple gilia, with scarce a green leaf making fine clouds of colour. Ribus bushes, vicinium and calmia, now in bloom, make beautiful rugs and borders along the banks of the streams. Shaggy beds of dwarf oak, Quercus chrysolopis, variant vicinifolia, over which one may walk, are common on rocky moraines, yet this is the same species as the large live oak seen near Brown's Flat. The most beautiful of the shrubs is the purple-flowered Bryanthus, here making glorious carpets at an elevation of nine thousand feet. The principal tree for the first mile or two from camp is the magnificent silver fir, which reaches perfection here both in size and form of individual trees and in the mode of grouping in groves with open spaces between. So trim and tasteful are these silvery, spiry groves one would fancy they must have been placed in position by some master landscape gardener, their regularity seeming almost conventional. But nature is the only gardener able to do work so fine. A few noble specimens, two hundred feet high, occupy central positions in the groups with younger trees around them, and outside of these another circle of yet smaller ones the whole arranged like tastefully symmetrical bouquets, every tree fitting nicely the place assigned to it, as if made especially for it. Small roses and eriogonums are usually found blooming on the open spaces about the groves, forming charming pleasure grounds. Higher, the firs gradually become smaller and less perfect, many showing double summits, indicating storm stress. Still, where good moraine soil is found, even on the rim of the lake basin, specimens 150 feet in height and 5 feet in diameter occur nearly 9,000 feet above the sea. The saplings, I find, are mostly bent with the crushing weight of the winter snow, which at this elevation must be at least 8 or 10 feet deep, judging by marks on the trees and this depth of compacted snow is heavy enough to bend and bury young trees twenty or thirty feet in height, and hold them down for four or five months. Some are broken, others spring up when the snow melts, and at length attain a size that enables them to withstand the snow pressure. Yet even in trees five feet thick the traces of this early discipline are still plainly to be seen, in their curved insteps, and frequently in old dried saplings protruding from the trunk, partially overgrown by the new axis developed from a branch below the break. Yet through all this stress the forest is maintained in marvellous beauty. Beyond the silver firs I find the two-leaved pine, variant Mariana, forms the bulk of the forest up to an elevation of ten thousand feet or more, the highest timber belt of the Sierra. I saw a specimen nearly five feet in diameter growing on deep, well-watered soil at an elevation of about nine thousand feet. The form of this species varies very much with position, 
exposure, soil, etc. On stream banks, where it is closely planted, it is very slender. Some specimens, seventy-five feet high, do not exceed five inches in diameter at the ground, but the ordinary form, as far as I have seen, is well proportioned. The average diameter, when full-grown at this elevation, is about twelve or fourteen inches, height forty or fifty feet. The straggling branches bent up at the end, the bark thin and bedraggled with amber-coloured resin. The pistillate flowers form little crimson rosettes, a fourth of an inch in diameter, on the ends of the branchlets, mostly hidden in the leaf tassels. The staminate are about three-eighths of an inch in diameter, sulphur yellow, in snowy clusters giving a remarkable rich effect. A brave, hardy mountaineer pine, growing cheerfully on rough beds of avalanche boulders and joints of rock pavements, as well as in fertile hollows, standing up to the waist in snow every winter for centuries, facing a thousand storms, and blooming every year in colours as bright as those worn by the sun-drenched trees of the tropics. A still hardier mountaineer is the Sierra Juniper, Juniperus occidentalis, growing mostly on domes and ridges and glacier pavements. A thick-set, sturdy, picturesque highlander, seemingly content to live for more than a score of centuries on sunshine and snow. A truly wonderful fellow, dogged endurance expressed in every feature, lasting about as long as the granite he stands on. Some are nearly as broad as high. I saw one on the shore of the lake nearly ten feet in diameter, and many six to eight feet. The bark, cinnamon-coloured, flakes off in long ribbon-like strips with a shiny lustre. Surely the most enduring of all tree mountaineers, it never seems to die a natural death, or even to fall after it has been killed. If protected from accidents, it would perhaps be immortal. I saw some that had withstood an avalanche from snowy Mount Hoffman cheerily putting out new branches, as if repeating, like Gip, never say die. Some were simply standing on the pavement where no fissure more than half an inch wide offered a hole for its roots. The common height for these rock-dwellers is from ten to twenty feet. Most of the old ones have broken tops, and are mere stumps, with a few tufted branches forming picturesque brown pillars on bare pavements, with plenty of elbow-room and a clear view in every direction. On good moraine soil it reaches a height of from forty to sixty feet, with dense grey foliage. The rings of the trunks are very thin, eighty to an inch of diameter in some specimens I examined. Those ten feet in diameter must be very old, thousands of years. Wish I could live, like these junipers, on sunshine and snow, and stand beside them on the shore of Lake Tanaya for a thousand years how much I should see, and how delightful it would be! Everything in the mountains would find me and come to me, and everything from the heavens like light." The lake was named for one of the chiefs of the Yosemite tribe. Old Tanaya is said to have been a good Indian to his tribe. When a company of soldiers followed his band into Yosemite to punish them for cattle-stealing and other crimes, they fled to this lake by a trail that leads out of the upper end of the valley, early in the spring, while the snow is still deep. But being pursued they lost heart and surrendered. A fine monument the old man has in this bright lake, and likely to last a long time, though lakes die as well as Indians, being gradually filled with detritus carried in by the feeding streams, and to some extent also by snow avalanches and rain and wind. A considerable portion of the Tanaya Basin is already changed into a forested flat and meadow at the upper end, where the main tributary enters from Cathedral Peak. Two other tributaries come from the Hoffman Range. The outlet flows westward through Tanaya Canyon to join the Merced River in Yosemite. Scarce a handful of loose soil is to be seen on the north shore. 
all is bare, shining granite, suggesting the Indian name of the lake, Pai Wayak, meaning shining rock. The basin seems to have been slowly excavated by the ancient glaciers, a marvellous work requiring countless thousands of years. On the south side an imposing mountain rises from the water's edge to the height of three thousand feet or more, feathered with hemlock and pine, and huge shining domes on the east, over the tops of which the grinding, wasting, moulding glacier must have swept as the wind does today. July 28. No cloud mountains, only curly cirrus wisps, scarce perceptible, and the want of thunder to strike the noon hour seems strange, as if the Sierra clock had stopped. Have been studying the Magnifica fir, measured one near two hundred and forty feet high, the tallest I have yet seen. This species is the most symmetrical of all conifers, but though gigantic in size, it seldom lives more than four or five hundred years. Most of the trees die from the attacks of a fungus at the age of two or three centuries. This dry-rot fungus perhaps enters the trunk by way of the stumps of limbs broken off by the snow that loads the broad palmate branches. The younger specimens are marvels of symmetry, straight and erect as a plumb line, their branches in regular level whirls of five mostly, each branch as exact in its divisions as a fern frond, and thickly covered by the leaves, making a rich plush over all the tree excepting only the trunk and a small portion of the main limbs. The leaves turn upwards, especially on the branchlets, and are stiff and sharp, pointed on all the upper portions of the tree. They remain on the tree about eight or ten years, and as the growth is rapid, it is not rare to find the leaf still in place on the upper part of the axis, where it is three or four inches in diameter, wide apart, of course, and their spiral arrangement beautifully displayed. The leaf scars are conspicuous for twenty years or more, but there is a good deal of variation in different trees as to the thickness and sharpness of the leaves. After the excursion to Mount Hoffman I have seen a complete cross-section of the Sierra Forest, and I find that Abies Magnifica is the most symmetrical tree of all the noble coniferous company. The cones are grand affairs, superb in form, size, and colour, cylindrical, stand erect on the upper branches like casks, and are from five to eight inches in length by three or four in diameter, greenish-grey, and covered with fine down which has a silvery lustre in the sunshine, and their brilliance is augmented by beads of transparent balsam, which seems to have been poured over each cone bringing to mind the old ceremonies of anointing with oil. If possible, the inside of the cone is more beautiful than the outside. The scales, bracts, and seed wings are tinted with the loveliest rosy purple, with a bright, lustrous iridescence. The seeds, three-fourths of an inch long, are dark brown. When the cones are ripe, the scales and bracts fall off setting the seeds free to fly to their predestined places, while the dead spike-like axes are left on the branches for many years to mark the positions of the vanished cones, excepting those cut off when green by the Douglas squirrel. How he gets his teeth under the broad bases of the sessile cones I don't know. Climbing these trees on a sunny day to visit the growing cones, and to gaze over the tops of the forest, is one of my best enjoyments. End of section nine.